Georgia State Senator Leroy Johnson has had a history of changing things. He was the first black Georgia State Senator since Reconstruction. He desegregated the Georgia State Capitol and was the first black chairman of a state Senate committee. He was also instrumental in helping the boxer Muhammad Ali obtain a boxing license after it had been revoked elsewhere in the United States. Senator Leroy Johnson shares his story in this edition of Spiritual Journey. I was born in Atlanta at Grady Hospital. I am what you call a Grady baby. Uh, <clears throat> the most interesting thing about my youth is the fact that I always believed that there would be a day in which I would be able to make a contribution to, 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 to the Atlanta community. So I went to Washington High School and I graduated from Washington High School and then I went to Mohouse College. And perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me, well, one of the best things, the first was to go to Mohouse College and to be under the tutorship and under the presidency of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. He was one of the great presidents of Mohouse, was a scholar, philosopher, PhD, just a tremendous person. And I went to Mohouse at the age of 17. I really didn't know who Leroy Johnson was. As a matter of fact, I grew up in a segregated society and without realizing I had accepted segregation in the fact that I went to the Fox Theater. The Fox Theater was on Peace Street Street and it was the eighth, one of the major theaters in Atlanta. But when you, went, when you go to the Fox Theater, you go to the front of the Fox, you pay your money and at that time, all black people, colored people, had to go around to the back of the fox and go up the stairs to the balcony to see the picture. Well, I had done that for many years, for many months before going to Mohouse. I went to Mohouse at 17 on a Monday. On a Tuesday at Mohouse, the president of Mohouse spoke to the student body, Benjamin E. Mays, tall, dark, handsome, very brilliant fellow. And he spoke to Mohouse and he said this, that Mohouse men must never accept segregation. Segregation is evil because it's predicated on a proposition that white people are better than black people, that they know more, that they're smarter. And Dr. May said to us, when God made you, he was at his highest and best, and no man is your master. And he said, whenever you go to a, the a segregated theater, you are accepting segregated, segregation, and you are admitting that the people downstairs are better than you. And I was sitting there on the front seat in Mohawk College Chapel on that Tuesday morning, and I had gone to Mohawk, at Mohawk on that Monday. And as he spoke to us, I was looking directly at him, and when he said that Mohas men must never accept segregation, that when you go to a segregated theater and pay for segregation, you are in fact endorsing segregation and making an admission that white people are better than you. And I sat there and I looked at him, and I thought Dr. Mays was talking directly to me. I thought he saw me Sunday going into the Fox Theater and that his speech, his address was directly to me. And I bowed my head and I thought that I would never finish Mohouse. And he said to me, he said to all the students, get yourselves an ideal and cling to it and worship it as though it was Almighty God. Because to advise, to survive in a segregated society, you must be ironclad and steel girded. And not from that day, from that day forward, I never ever went to a segregated theater. And I decided then that I would be one of those persons who would champion against segregation and discrimination. 
That was the decision I made at Moe House at 17. One of the best decisions I made in my life. The other decision I made in my life, which was number two, was at Moe House, I met a Spellman young lady who was at the school of Spellman right across the street from Moe House. And I met her, her name was Cleopatra. And I had never met a Afro-American girl named Cleopatra. And I was just fascinated. And I asked her if she would go to the drugstore and have a drink of Coca-Cola with me. She said yes. So we met, we began to court as boyfriend and girlfriend, and now we've been married for 67 years. The best second decision that I've ever made in my life. But from Mo House, I went to Atlanta University and got a degree in political science. Dr. Board was my professor at Atlanta University, and he was also president of the Georgia chapter of the NAACP, and he was a great influence on me. At, at the, um, during the class of, uh, that we had uh, at Atlanta University for, for political science, we didn't have a book. He taught from the New York Times. He would bring the New York Times in, and he would make his speech and, and, and taught his class in political science from the New York Times. Well, I was very impressed with him and decided to go to law school as a result of that. Then I left Atlanta University and went to law school at North Carolina Central University School of Law. And I was, I finished there in 19, I believe, 57 and came back uh, to Atlanta and began to work in the Solicitor General's office, uh, who is now the District Attorney's office, but it was Solicitor General then. And I worked there for a couple of, four years, I believe, and then decided to run for the office of the, of the Senate. But that decision came because of the United States Supreme Court decision of one man, one vote, or one person, one vote. At that time, in Georgia, there was a county unit system. And the county unit system was a political system that gave more votes to the rural county than it did to the urban counties. And the Supreme Court came out with a decision of one man, one vote, which equalized the vote in Georgia and I decided to run for the, United, for the state senate. And at that time, a black person had never been to the Georgia Senate in 100 years. During the period of Reconstruction, you had black persons in legislatures. In 1862, the end of Reconstruction, all the blacks were moved out of, the, out, of, out of the legislative system altogether in the South and in the East. So in, in October, in, in 1962, after, after the Supreme Court decision of one man, one vote, I ran for office and was fortunate enough to be elected and was elected in 1962. In my election, the difference in my election in the elections anywhere else was that in Georgia, in my election, it was the first time that a black man had been elected to the legislature of Georgia or to any southern legislature in 100 years in 1862, which was the end of, of, um, of that period in which black people were in, in service and then was kicked out of service. And from 1962, up until the time I left the Senate, which was about 15 years later, uh, I was the only black beginning in 1962 to serve in the Senate of Georgia. So that was very interesting. I served under three governors, Governor Carl Sanders and Governor uh, Jimmy Carter and Governor Lester Maddox. Uh, I was a lawyer when I went into the Senate and I practiced law, law, I practiced law for 54 years in Georgia, and I resigned and retired from the law practice in 2013. And uh, during that period of time, I had such a great opportunity, and one of which was to aid and assist Muhammad Ali. 
when I went into the Senate in 1962, the state capitol was segregated. There were signs on the doors, on the, along the restroom doors, colored and white. There were signs over water fountain, colored and white. A black person had never eaten in the state cafeteria in 1962 when I was elected. My election, I went into office in 63, so my task was very clear. The first thing I thought that I had to do, without fanfare, with no publication, no publicity, I thought I had to desegregate the state capitol. Under the laws of the Georgia Senate, you had the opportunity to appoint at least two senators, or two persons, each day to serve as a page a boy or a girl, to run errands for the senators. Well, each day I would appoint four boys or four girls instead of two. And then I would take them to the restrooms and where, if they were all boys that I appointed, I would take them to the restroom where it had the sign on it of white. And I said, you go in there and use the restroom, and I'll stand out here, or when we were with them, it was a boy. I went with him, and we did that for weeks. It was a girl, I would send her to the restroom which says white on it, I stand outside and wait for her to come out. I instructed all of my pages to drink the water from the fountain which is said white. And there was a guard on the, on the fl third floor his job was, of course, to walk around and make sure that the, that the peace was kept and that everything was fine and, uh, as it related to the Georgia Senate. And he saw me taking the black boys into the restroom that says white, having my black pages to drink water from the fountain that says white instead of black. So he came up to me and says, look, you know, you can't drink water from this fountain. You have to drink water from that other fountain. And I said, I, I understand what you're saying, but you understand that I'm a state senator with all the rights and privileges appertaining there too, and my pages will drink when I ask them to drink. And we did that for a month. And finally somebody went downstairs and told the governor that I was interfering with the proceeds, the process of the state senate by having my pages to drink from the fountains which says white instead of colored, and go into the bathroom that says white instead of colored. And so after about a month and a half, I went there one morning and all the signs were down, all colored and white. All of them had been removed. Governor Sanders downstairs on the second floor, the senators on the third floor, had moved the signs. Didn't say anything to me, I didn't say anything to him. The rest, the cafeteria had, had, the state cafeteria had never served a black person in that cafeteria uh, until I got there in 62. In 62, I went to the, in 63, I went to the cafeteria to have dinner, to have lunch. And one of the members of my delegation, who was um, uh, Ab uh, Lebanese, Joe Salome, went with me. I said, Joe, I want to go into the cafeteria, and it's about time that we desegregate the state cafeteria. Well, Joe Salone was a Lebanese, but he could go by himself, and they said nothing to Joe Salone. When Joe Salone decided to go with me to the cafeteria, they stopped us at the door. I says, wait, you, you can't come in. We don't serve Negroes. And I said, I understand what you just said, but you understand that in addition to being a Negro, I'm a state senator. And we wore a badge that says the 38th District, Leroy Johnson, senator from the 38th District. And I said, so I'm going to have lunch in the, in the cafeteria. And she says, well, I can't serve you. I said, I suggest you go and talk to your supervisor. And so she left and went and talked to the supervisor and came back and said, come on in. And we went in, got our trays, walked through the line, paid what we were to pay. And the cafeteria was a big open space 
with with uh, long seats, and on each side of the long tables, each side of the table was about six or seven uh, places for people to sit. The cafeteria was basically full, and there was an area on the side where there were about five or six tables, and one of them had a vacancy. So Joseph Long goes to the table, sit his tray down, and nobody said anything. I was behind him. I came to the table and set my tray down. And when I set my tray down on the table, all the white red, all the white people got up from the table and left. Joseph sat down, and I sat down, and we had the whole long table to ourselves. And about three minutes later, the table behind us, in that same area, all the white people got up and left and went to another area. And then the table behind us, after that, all the people got up and left and went to another area. So Joe and I had, for that evening, that whole section by ourselves uh, for, to be served, to eat. We then left, and as a result of that, we desegregated, I desegregated the cafeteria of the state capitol. The next day, I called Q.B. Williamson, who was a black alderman uh, at the, for City Hall, and asked him to have lunch with me. And I did that on two or three other occasions, and called my friends and said, come on, have lunch with me. And from the first day we went up until they decided to then to say it's open to everybody. Uh, we desegregated the state capitol. So that was a part of the thing that I thought that I had to do as a state senator. And then the question was being accepted as an equal. As the first day that I went to the Senate, not any of the white senators from from North from North Georgia and South Georgia spoke to me. The only people that spoke to me was people in my delegation from Fulton County, city of Atlanta. But none of the white delegation would speak to me. I would walk down to, to the hall of the Senate and say good morning as I approached another senator going in the opposite direction. Good morning, senator, and the response would be mm. And I kept doing that. Each time I passed one and say, good morning, Senator, the response would be, uh. I thought maybe uh was a name that I did not recognize, but it was a part of a, of a procedure, a senator, but it was not their name, it was their response to my saying good morning. And for the first session, one week before the end of the first session, none of the senators had spoken to me. What well, each senator is given a committee assignment when he gets to the Senate. And on one occasion, last, with the last week of the Senate, I went to one of my committees, and in a committee, bills are brought by other senators who want the bills to come out of the committee and go back to the floor of the Senate to be voted on, to be passed. Well, when I got to the, to the Senate meeting, a bill had been discussed in the Senate committee, brought up, and it was a tie vote. A bill cannot pass the Senate committee with a tie vote. You have to have a majority vote for it to pass out, go to the floor to be passed to become a law. When I got to the door, I was running late. When I got to the door, the bill had come up in the committee. It was a tie vote. When I opened the door, and walked into the room, the senators who were at the table and had voted for and against the bill jumped up. The senators who had not spoken to me for the whole session ran over to the door and grabbed my, actually touched me, and said, Senator, I need your vote. And for a moment, I wonder what happened to my blackness. Those senators who actually touched me for the first time and spoke to me for the first time had asked for their, asked me for my vote in order to get the bill that had come up and was a tie vote out of the committee to go on the floor. And I stood there 
with a moment of grace. And I said to myself, if I did know how important the vote was, I know now. Because those senators who had not spoken to me at all for the first session, for doing the first session, when I walked in the room, didn't see the black man that they had not voted, had not spoken to. They saw a vote, a vote that would take their bill if passed out of the out of committee onto the floor of the Senate. I knew then how important the vote was. I've always thought it was important, but if I had any doubt at all, it was removed from my mind. In politics, the most important thing is the vote. And I realized that. I also realized that in a moment like this, you have to maximize it. I had two bills that I had already sent to the committee, and the committee had already taken the two bills and put it on what they call death row to never come up again. At that moment, I said, if you want my vote, each, each side, I want my bills to be called up, brushed off, and voted out before I, make, before I vote. I want some commitment that that would be done. And so what had happened is that my bill was called up, my bill was voted due pass out of the committee, then I voted for the vote to be, the tie vote, I broke the tie, one of the bills that, and the bills of course passed, and the example that I arrived from that, and the example that I, that I make certain that 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 I obtained uh, as a result of that that incident was this particular philosophy in politics. Unfortunately, no matter how capable you are, how much knowledge you may have of the system, in politics you get not what you deserve, but what you can negotiate. And I negotiated my bills out of that committee that had already been sent to this, what they call the cement committee, uh, out of the committee, before I cast my vote for the bill to be passed out of the committee. But that was the process that, that, that the part of the process that I went to before I got to the point of, of Ali. You had to first prove to the body that you had the ability, the knowledge, the wisdom to be an effective senator, notwithstanding the fact that your color was different. And that's what I did. I became chairman of the, one of the most powerful commit committees in the Senate, which was the Judiciary Committee. Uh, be chairman of a committee, you can then appoint, you have an office, and you have the ability to appoint assistant, a secretary and assistant. And for the first black secretary I appointed to the Georgia Senate, the first black person to serve as an assistant to a committee I appointed we had an office in the Capitol, and then at that point, uh, which was three or four years later, uh, you had the acceptability of the people that you were working with. And it was during that time that I had an opportunity to deal with Muhammad Ali. It was my understanding that some six to seven cities had said no, he would never fight again after the Boxing Commission in New York had said that he could not fight because he did not go to the Vietnam War. His decision not to participate in the Vietnam War was a religious decision. And he said his religion prevented him from agreeing to go to the Vietnam War. The case was carried to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court agreed with that decision. And when it, three years later, they came out and said that, that uh, he did not have to go because of it was a religious decision. But during those three years that the case was going to the Supreme Court, he was denied the opportunity to, to box anywhere in the United States. Six or seven city had said, no, you would never box in, in, in the United States again. When I was sitting in my office and I got a call from Harry Pett 
who was a gentleman who lived in Atlanta, but he had a nephew in uh, New York. And, um, and his nephew was head of the House of Sports in New York. And he said, Senator, we're trying to find a venue where Ali would be given a license. And if we had a venue, I can, we can get a license for Ali to fight. And he said, someone told me to call you to see if you could get a license for Ali in Georgia. And I said to Harry Pett, I'm not so sure, but let me call you back in a couple of days and, and give you an answer. Well, I was a lawyer, so I had a law firm, and I had my law firm to search the Georgia law to determine what the law said about the boxing matches in Georgia. And three days later, I found out that there was no law on the books of Georgia dealing with the boxing commission. The only reference to the boxing in the laws of Georgia at that time was that a boxing match had to be determined by the municipality, which was to hold the boxing, the, the boxing uh, match itself. But it was no state law to set up a boxing commission dealing with the boxing, boxing in Georgia at that time in 1962. So when my staff reported to me what the law says, I called Harry Pat and said, Harry, I can get him a license to fight in Georgia. And he said, well, I'll have my people to come down to talk with you about it. A week later, we met at one of the hotels at the airport about the boxing match, drew up a contract, and agreed on, on, the, on the contract. And my job was to get the license for Ali to fight after the, after, the, uh, after the New York Boxing Commission had said he would not, could not fight anywhere else. That was the beginning of my task. That was my task. It was a very difficult task because most people said to me, you'll never be able to do it. If 56 cities had turned him down or 65 cities had turned him down, how in the world do you think you're going to get it in Georgia? And the governor of Georgia is Lester Maddox. So how are you going to do that? Well, I believed with all my heart and soul that because I was a Mohouse man that I could do what most men could not do. Because Dr. May said to us at Mohouse that if you finish Mohouse, then you finish with a different vision your vision is not to be, to believe that you are less than anybody else, but to believe that you are as good or better than anybody else. My connection had, had something to do with it, but the idea that I could do it against the tremendous art was my training at Morehouse. You know, you have Harvard, Yale, Princeton, great institutions. But you have Benjamin Mays at Mohouse, who really taught us that when God made us, he was at his highest and best. And I believe that. And believing it so intensely, I thought that I could do it, even though the odds were against me uh, doing it, see. But... Uh, we, 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 but but that, that, was where the, that was where my motivation. The other thing was the, my, my contact that I had. One thing I learned in politics that is so important is nothing like friendship. It's nothing like friendship in politics. The friendship I had with the mayor of the city of Atlanta, with Sam Marcel, the friendship I had with Carl Sanders, who was the governor of the state, that's, most, that's greatly important, see? And based on friendship, people do things for you based on friendship. See? And without that, I could have never gotten, even though I believed I could do it uh, because of my experience at Morehouse, I could have never gotten it done without the relationship that I had built as a result of, of my own political uh, movement in the, in, the, in the community. 
is nothing as important as friendship. If you develop a friendship, uh, uh, that's extremely important. I have always been a Baptist, and I was a member of Wheat Street Baptist Church, where Reverend William Holm Borders was the pastor. A, he's a graduate of Morehouse also, a great preacher, and was my friend. And I left Free, uh, Wheat Street Baptist Church and went to Ebenezer. And Martin Luther King Sr., his father, was my pastor uh, at Ebenezer. And it was from him and my contact with the people at Ebenezer Church, but basically the pastor, which was Pastor uh, uh, M.L. King Sr. and Joe, Joseph Roberts, uh, that I really got involved in, in, the, in, in, the, in my own personal uh, situation. Martin Luther King Jr. was at Mohawks with me I finished Mohawks in the class of 1949. Martin Luther King Jr. finished Mohawks in the class of 1948. In 1948, Martin Luther King Jr. went to the NAACP from Mohawks as a, as a, as a, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, delegate. And then I went as his sister delegate in 1948. So my religious feeling had always been two things, one as a Baptist and one as a belief. And I believe in, 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 the, in, the, in the tenets of the Baptist church. And I've been a Baptist, I've been at Ebenezer for 44 years. And I chaired the trustee board for 15 years at Ebenezer Baptist Church. So that's, that's a part of my... Uh, my religious life, and particularly my mother, my, both, both my mother and father, but particularly my mother, who really believed that, and let me put it this way, as she would say to me and to my sister, it was two of us, me and my sister, that she thought and believed that we had to do more than what she was able to do when she was coming along. And my father, who was a mortician, believed very strongly that was nothing as important as work. You had to have a work ethics in order to survive, in order to do well. And, and it, was from the, it, was, it was from him that I got my work ethics. At 15, I went to the tobacco farm uh, in Connecticut, uh, a program that Morehouse had with the tobacco people in Connecticut where students can come back during the summer, work and uh, help pay for their schooling, uh, or what have you. Uh, but it was from him that I got my work ethics. And my, my belief, my Christian belief, came from both my mother and father, but my mother was really strict in terms of the things that we could do and the things that we could not do. And one thing that she said that we could not do was to let me put it this way, she says, if you don't think much of yourself, nobody else will. So you got to think well of yourself in order for other people to, to think well of you. And that if you do anything, you got to do it with the belief that you're doing the right thing. And I never will forget what she said to us. She says, I will not always be with you. I hope that I live a long life, but I want you to know that I hope you will always do the right thing, but I want you to remember that your mother will always be with you, right or wrong. And I guess, I guess that was the thing that, that, that made me so dear to her, she, uh, that she insists on doing right, but she also gave me the belief that I, I guess you would say what this girl, young girl said that, that recently that I have your back and uh, 
uh, way before that became popular, mm -hmm. she said to me, in a sense, not using those exact words, but meaning the same thing, I want you to do the right thing, but I have your back. As a result of my having run for the state senate, gave me some of the tools and some of the props that I had when I got ready to deal with Ali's situation. Uh, when I ran for the state senate, I wasn't sure, even though I, I, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to make it because of the political situation. We had a judge by the name of Pi who did not have a reputation of being a great friend of black people. And he was, on the, on the, he was one of the judges that had to make a decision when the law came down as a one man, one vote, who would be, who would be the next senator from the 38th district. And even though I won the 38th district, if he had said that it was, it was going to be, the vote was going to be counted on a countywide basis, I would not have been elected. And he was the judge who had to make that decision. He made the decision of one person, one vote, and said that the, the person who won the election in the 38th district would be the senator from the 38th district. And that was a difficult process. Uh, but we won that. And then when we got to the Senate, the senators from the North Georgia and South Georgia, who wouldn't speak to me at all, created another problem that I should not have had because, and I only had because of the color of my skin. Not because I didn't have the intellectual ability uh, to do it, and not because I didn't have the, I was a lawyer and there was then fewer lawyers in the state body than now. Uh, but that was not the curse question of my, 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 uh, my ability, but it only because of the color of my skin. And it took me three years or four years before I could, in the Senate of Georgia, before I could get the, before I could be accepted on the basis of equality of other senators. See? And once you, was accepted, and then of course the whole picture changed. Uh, when I became chairman of the Judiciary Committee, one of the most powerful committees in the Senate, my relationship with all the senators was was great, you know. Uh, uh, but because of that, it made the Ali situation one in which if I had to choose between the two that you question you asked me, which was the most difficult, would be the Senate. Because I had to not only get elected, but at once get it, once I have once I was elected, I had to prove that I could be as an effective senator as a white person. And that that's the difference.